Why does it often take the worst times to bring out the best in people? I'm not sure why that is, except that light tends to shine the brightest in the darkest situations. It may be that the best has always been there, but it's only when times are bad that the best shines the brightest. I often use this illustration. If you take one of those little candles you put on a birthday cake, if you take that outside at noon and light it, do you even know it's lit? But if you take that same candle outside at midnight and light it, it's amazing how much light it gives. It actually gives the same amount of light. It just seems like more in the darkness. And that's how our light shines as well. Last Sunday we began a, a, a series of messages on the life of Caleb in the Old Testament, borrowing a title from President John F. Kennedy's book, Profiles in Courage. In this book, Kennedy wrote, Great crises produce great men and great deeds of courage. Well, I would suggest that great crises reveal great men more than produce them. If the greatness is not already there, it's probably not going to happen when the time of crisis comes. But what happens is the crisis reveals greatness, especially when we talk about the characteristic of courage. And this morning we're going to see in the life of Caleb, courage in spite of antagonism. Courage when you're outnumbered. How to take a stand for what's right, even when the majority is against you. Now you'll remember from last week's message how Caleb was one of 12 men chosen to go into the land of Canaan and check it out. Moses chose one man from each of the 12 tribes, said go into the land and bring back a report. Tell us what it's like. In fact, uh, we read in Numbers 13, beginning in verse 17, the assignment that was given. Moses said to them, Go up through the Negev into the hill country. See what land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or are they fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. And it was the season for the first ripe grapes. So Moses gives them the assignment. Go check it out. Bring back some samples if you can. Let us see what's ahead of us. And also check out the, the inhabitants of the land. Do they live in fortified cities? Are there a lot of them? And so they went up. They explored from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Libo Hamath. Uh, and as we're going to see in a little bit, they covered pretty much the whole territory of Canaan, uh, from south to north and then back uh, to where they were on the southern edge. And it says that uh, among the things they found was a single cluster of grapes that it took two men to carry on a pole. Just, just picture that in your mind. <laughs> One cluster of grapes that takes two grown men to carry on a pole between them. Gives you an idea of what kind of land this is. Now understand what they have been encountering. They've been in the desert. Sinai Peninsula can't grow a weed. And here they are going in this land and they... they, they uh, characterize it as flowing with milk and honey. It's a prosperous land. It, it, it enables people to grow. There's trees there. You know, there's, there's uh, land where you can grow crops. It, it's, it was very beautiful. And for 40 days, they went and uh, spied out the land. Now, the spies were sent to determine not whether the people can take the land, but what the land was like. That's a very important thing to understand. 
Their mission was not, go see if we can take this land. God had already told them, I'm giving you this land. So there was no question about whether they could do it. The question was, what's it like? Now, reading here in Numbers, we get the impression that this was God's idea. God told Moses, send these 12 men. But if you read the parallel passage in Deuteronomy 1, you discover that the Lord was kind of giving in to the people. It's the people who wanted to go check it out. It's the people who weren't ready to just go in and do it. They wanted to see ahead of time. G. Campbell Morgan observes, The hour had now arrived when the people should have gone forward. The story of the sending of the spies, as told in Numbers, indicates that it was done in obedience to the divine command. The comparison of this, however, with Moses' account of it in Deuteronomy 1, verses 19 through 25, show that this command of the Lord was the result of a determination on the part of the people to do so. This itself was an act of suspicion and unbelief. God says, go. And the people says, uh, maybe not. Let's form a committee. Let's talk about this. Let's go check it out first. So why, why, why would God give in to that? God does. God understands. Sometimes we're not as ready to act in faith. Uh, I think of Gideon. When God called Gideon, remember uh, the requests that Gideon made? You know, I'm going to put this fleece out and, you know, the next morning let the fleece be dry and the grass be wet with dew. And the next time let the grass be dry and the fleece be wet, you know. And God did that. I know sometimes reading through the Bible, I'm tempted to think, you know, if I was God, I wouldn't mess with that kind of stuff. Good thing I'm not God, right? <laughs> yes, you can say amen to that, yeah. God understands our weaknesses. And where their faith needed a little bolstering, he says, okay, go check it out. You're going to see how great this land is. And so they did. Now, most of the places that are mentioned here in Numbers and Deuteronomy are unknown to us today. But some of these place names are beginning to turn up uh, in archaeological finds, uh, sometimes in the uh, hieroglyphics in Egypt that they've discovered, they'll find some of these names. Uh, also in some of the discoveries there in uh, the land of Canaan, the ancient land of Canaan, uh, we know where some of these things are. Uh, but the idea is they started south on the very southern edge of what is now Israel, and they went about 100 miles north of the Sea of Galilee which is way up in the northern part of what is Israel. So they covered the whole land, south to north and then back again. And I'm sure that the spies kind of spread out as they went uh, to cover from west to east. So they covered the entire land in 40 days, and they came back. The spies returned, and we have a majority report and a minority report. The first that we see is the fearful report, beginning in Numbers 13, verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron, the whole Israelite community at Kadesh, in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them in the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land in which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. They were honest at this point. I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore the cluster of grapes that big, right? And they did say, beautiful land, bountiful land, able to grow all kinds of things here. This is a, a great place to live. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak, there. This word in the Hebrew, anakim, is very similar to a word we find in Genesis 6, nephilim. Both are 
translated into English, giants. Big people. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. They said, we can't attack these people, they are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they'd explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Despite the facts, despite what they saw of how great the land is, and more importantly, despite the fact that the Lord said, I will give this to you, Ten of these twelve spies said, we can't do it. The people are too large. The cities are fortified. We can't do it. The report quickly turned from giant produce to a giant problem, literally. They're saying that the people there are large. And, and I want you to notice, as the report goes on, the exaggeration gets bigger, okay? Now, the fruit was indisputable because it was right there. At the beginning of the report, they said, the cities are fortified and the people are large. Some of the descendants of Anak are there, which are these giants. Later on in the report, they're saying, everybody's a giant. And the land swallows up the people. That's not true. Now, yes, there were giants in the land. And I know some people think, ah, they're exaggerating. But later on in the history of Israel, remember a guy named Goliath? He was a descendant of Anak. He was one of these giants. He was nine foot six. Every NBA team would love to have that guy, right? So there literally were giants, but when you get to the end, all of the people are giants. And, and we're, we're, we're just grasshoppers, right? That's how we looked in our eyes, and that's how we were in their eyes too. Really? Where'd you learn ESP? How do you know what they're thinking? They probably didn't even see you. But see, we project our insecurities into the situation. When we lose our faith and we lose our, our vision of God, we see how small we are and everything gets exaggerated. That's what fear does. Fear exaggerates every problem from being something that might be manageable to something that isn't. Something that we can get to the point where not even God can deal with it because we have created a problem so large. I know sometimes people ask the question, can God create a stone so big that he can't move it? And the answer is no, but we can. We do it all the time in our own minds. We exaggerate a situation till we don't even think God can deal with it. And we throw up our hands and say, we can't do it. Warren Wiersbe writes, they saw the giants and they saw themselves as grasshoppers, but they did not see God. Their eyes were on the obstacles, not on the God who had led them there. Instead of reporting the blessings of the land, the ten spies emphasized the difficulties, giving an evil report of God's holy land. Fear always sees the obstacles, Faith always sees the opportunities. Fear exaggerates. It makes problems bigger than they really are. And not only do we see ourselves as smaller than we are, we see God that way too. That was the problem with the majority report. I like the way Stuart Briscoe puts it. Caleb and Joshua had the grapes and the rest had gripes. 
pretty much it. Now notice, when they saw themselves as grasshoppers, they assumed that the Canaanites thought they were grasshoppers too. But we know that that's not true. I know we got to jump ahead quite a bit in the story. But in Joshua chapter 2, when they finally cross into the promised land, and the first place they come to is Jericho, again, spies were sent, just two of them this time. They go into Jericho, they run into a, a fine, upstanding woman named Rahab. <clears throat> Remember what Rahab said? We've heard about you people, and we're scared to death. We heard about how your God brought you out of Egypt and how he drowned the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea. We heard all of these stories about what your God is doing, and we are shaking in our boots. It's in the Hebrew. We're scared to death of you people. And yet, the ten spies projected their fear into the situation and said, they look at us like grasshoppers too. Wasn't even accurate. But when we see ourselves as nothing, not even the obvious facts make a difference. It completely it skews our perspective. And this grasshopper complex is one of the most crippling of all psychological attitudes. Erwin Lutzer comments, perhaps the gr greatest single sin of Christians in any century is the mistake made by these spies facing human problems with human resources. Whether it's preparing a church budget, deciding how to share our faith, or tackling our personal problems, the question is often, how much can I do? Seldom do we ask how much can God do. As a result, perpetual failure is inevitable. Instead of comparing our problems with God, we compare our problems to ourselves. Little wonder we soon feel like grasshoppers amongst an army of giants. Do you consciously include God in all of your plans? Do you face the future with optimism, knowing that nothing is too hard for the Lord? Or is your life characterized by human abilities human responses, and human resources. Only those who learn to expose each new situation to the living God are delivered from the curse of the grasshopper complex. That's the fearful report. And it was given by 10 of the 12 spies. Think about that. 83% came back and agreed on this. But it wasn't a unanimous opinion. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua, had a different story. They delivered the minority report, which I'm characterizing as the faithful response. Now, they saw exactly the same things, but they saw it differently. After the ten had stirred up the people with their pessimism, we read in Numbers 13, 30, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we certainly can do it. The ten were saying, Oh no, we can't do this. Can't be done. Caleb says, It can be done. With no doubt, we certainly can do this brimming with optimism. Now if you go down into chapter 14, pick up in verse 6. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Here are two men out of twelve standing up and saying, No! The majority is not right. 
This is a wonderful land and the Lord will give it to us. Now, I'm going to give a little concession to the ten spies. They were right in one thing. We can't do it. But notice the emphasis here. The Lord will. The Lord will give us this land. He's promised to do it. We should go forward. You might wonder if these, if these two were on the same mission as the other ten, right? I mean, did you see the same things? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. They reported that the land is flowing with milk and honey. They reported that, yes, the cities are fortified. Yeah, there's giants there. I really don't think that Caleb and Joshua were in the land and Caleb's like, I don't see any giants, Joshua, do you? They weren't closing their eyes to the realities. They had a firm grasp on the situation. I think they were more realistic than the ten because the ten had forgot about God. And God is the reality in our lives. He is the difference maker. The big difference between the two and the ten was that the two saw God and the ten didn't. Caleb took a stand and said, we can do this. No, God can do this. God will do this. If we obey him, he is going to give us the victory. Don't listen to these guys about the giants. We have a God who is greater. They basically said, Taking this land will be a piece of cake. Literally, in Hebrew, verse 9 says a piece of bread. <laughs> that was their way of saying it back then. And what we find here in Caleb and Joshua is the very essence of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith this way. Faith is the confidence of what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about things we cannot see. Confidence and assurance, that certainly marks Caleb and Joshua here, doesn't it? And those two things are what faith is all about. Confidence, assurance, but not in ourselves. We are confident and assured in God. Last week I mentioned a passage from 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 and 5. I think it fits here as well. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. When we put our faith in God and what He can do, nothing is impossible. We can be confident, we can be assured that God will do what He says He's going to do. And that's putting our faith in Him. Now, we're not being confident in ourselves. Our competence comes from God, who has said, I will do this through you. Fear sees the obstacles. Faith sees the opportunities. Fear focuses on the outward circumstances. Faith focuses on the omnipotent creator. Faith says it can, fear says it can't be done. Faith says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When life's challenges arise, will we face them in fear or will we face them in faith? Now the story doesn't end here. On hearing both sides... The people of Israel accepted the majority report and rejected the minority report of Joshua and Caleb. They made a decision that determined their destiny. Numbers 14 verses 1 through 4 records their furious reaction. That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept. 
aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. You might think the people would hail Caleb and Joshua for their faith, but they had a different idea. You go down to verse 10 and it appears they wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua to death. How about that for taking a stand for what's right? For standing up in faith in God, people want to kill you. That's what's going to happen in this world that is run by fear. Where the majority of people don't see God, they only see the obstacles. They're going to resent you. They're going to hate you. They're going to try to silence you. When we stand in faith, don't expect to be applauded. Expect the antagonism of the majority. You know, we might wonder, how could the people come to this fateful conclusion? They simply followed the majority. We know all about that, don't we? We live in a democracy. The majority has to be right. Really? <laughs> you go through a lot of the Bible and you find the majority is often dead wrong. And this is a clear example of that. I remember reading a quote that says, if we truly believe what the Bible says about human nature, it's doubtful the majority is ever right. We can't just go by numbers. Chuck Swindoll writes, Those who don't have vision or determination and refuse to dream the impossible are always in the majority. Therefore, they will always take the vote. They will always outshout and outnumber those who walk by faith and not by sight. Those who are seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Those who choose to live by sight will always outnumber those who choose to live by faith. Ten saw the problem. Two saw the solution. Ten saw the obstacles. Two saw the answers. Ten were impressed with the size of the men. Two were impressed by the size of their God. Ten focused on what could not be accomplished Two focused on what could easily be accomplished by the power of God. Again, the persistence demonstrated by Caleb and Joshua is nothing short of remarkable. Neither was more intelligent than the other ten, nor more talented. They simply possessed bulldog determination, which is just a nice way of saying faith. Andrew Jackson once said, one man with courage makes a majority. Others have said, God plus one makes a majority. To be the only one to stand on the side of God takes courage, especially in the face of a furious reaction like Caleb and Joshua faced. Again, going back to what President Kennedy wrote in Profiles in Courage, it takes great courage to do what you think is right, even if it may mean the end of your career and the dislike and criticism of your friends and neighbors. And let's face it, that's the truth. If you're going to stand on your faith in God, in spite of the fear of the majority, you are risking your reputation. You are risking friendships. You may risk the acceptance of your own family. But one thing you won't risk is defeat. Because if you stand in faith, God will work and he will work through you. Now, for his part, God had had enough. Down in Numbers 10, the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting unto all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I've performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. God was ready to just wipe the people off the face of the earth. I'm done with them. 
I've done all of these things, bringing them out of Egypt, providing for them every day, miraculously. They're seeing miracles on a daily basis. When time comes, they're, they're given up. They don't believe in me at all. Now, Moses prayed on their behalf. He asked God to spare them, not because they deserved it, but for his own glory. His reasoning was, after all, God, if you bring him out of Egypt and do all this and kill him here, what are people going to say? God listened to Moses' request. In verse 20, he says, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went into and his descendants will inherit it. The Israelites had rejected the land the God had brought them to and their punishment was they would never enter it. They said, we can't go in. The Lord said, you won't go in. Except for Caleb. God makes special mention of Caleb, promising that he will go into the promised land and possess it for himself and his descendants. Caleb said, we can go in. And the Lord said, you will go in. That's how the Lord responds to faith. What a difference faith makes. So how do we apply this message to our lives today? The lesson is quite clear. The majority is not always right. In fact, it is very often wrong. The men God uses are always standing against the flow. Men like Martin Luther and William Carey, William Wilberforce, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. How we need to remember this. Ours is a day when truth is determined by consensus, when justice is struck by a five to four vote, when everybody doing it has become the pervasive rationale for our behavior, when Thomas Jefferson's fear of the tyranny of the majority is a reality. Spiritual leaders do not necessarily go along with the majority opinion. It takes courage to stand up for what we know is right, even when nobody else is. Don't get swept away in public opinion or popular thinking. The crowds usually run on fear. We are called to live by faith. And only then will we experience the, the life of victory as God promised to Caleb. He was courageous in spite of antagonism. And in the end, he saw the promise of God fulfilled. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example we have in Caleb and Joshua, men of faith who stood against a whole nation of fear. May we stand with you and for you, not getting swept up in what the majority of our culture or even the majority of our people might say when they lose sight of you. May we always see the opportunities of faith and not the obstacles of fear. And may we have the opportunity to lead others to a knowledge of you through faith that they might experience that victory as well. Go with us now. Help us to put this into action. We pray this in the victorious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.